Hi, Room 15. This is Chapter 18, The Air Ducks, Secret of Them. And so it was. By teaching us to read, they had taught us how to get away. Justin climbed easily up the open door of his cage and vanished over the top with a flick of his tail. He came back an hour later, greatly excited and full of information. Yet it was typical of Justin that even as excited as he was, he stayed calm and thought clearly. He climbed down the front of my cage rather than his own and spoke softly. We both assumed that by now the other rats were asleep. Nicodemus, come on out. I'll show you how. He directed me as I reached through the wire bars of the door and felt beneath it. I found the small metal knob, slid it forward and sideward, and felt the door swing loose against my shoulder. I followed him up the side of the cage to the shelf above. There we stopped. It was the first time I had met Justin face to face. He said, it's better talking than here than around those partitions. Yes. Did you get down? Yes. How did you get back up? At the end of the shelf, there's a big cabinet. They keep the mouse cages in it. It has wire mesh doors. You can climb up and down like a ladder. Of course, I said. I remember now. I had seen that cabinet many times when my cage was carried past it. For some reason, perhaps because they are similar, the mice were kept in the cages within a cage. Just Justin said, Nicodemus, I think I found the way to get out. You have? At the end of each of the room, there's an opening in the baseboard at the bottom of the wall. Air blows in through one of them and out the other. Each one has a metal grid covering it, and on the grid, there's a sign that says, Lift to adjust airflow. I lifted one of them. It hangs on hinges like a trap door. Behind it, there's a thing like a metal window. When you slide it open, more air blows in. But the main thing is, it's easily big enough to walk through and get out. But what's on the other side? Where does it lead? On the other side, there's a duct, a thing like a square metal pipe built right into the wall. I walked along it, not very far, but I can figure out where it must go. There's bound to be a duct like that leading to every room in the building, and they must all branch off one main central pipe. And then there was the one, that one has to lead somewhere to the outside, because that's where the air comes from. That's why I think they open the windows. I don't think these windows can open. He was right, of course. The building had central air conditioning, which we ha what we had to do is find the main air shaft and explore it. There would have been, t there would have to be an intake at one end and an outlet at the other, and that was easier said than done. And before it was done, there was questions to be answered. What about the rest of the rats? There were twenty of us in the laboratory, and we had to let the others know. So one by one, we woke them and showed them how to open their cages. It was an odd assembly that gathered that night under the dimmed lights in the echo echoing laboratory. On the shelf where Justin and I had talked, we all knew each other in a way, from the passing of messages over the preceding months, yet except for Jenner and me, none of us had really ever met. We were strangers, though, as you can imagine, it had not taken long for us to develop a feeling of camaraderie, for we twenty were alone in this strange world. Just how alone and how strange none of us really understood at first, yet in a way we sensed it from the beginning. The group looked to me as leader, probably because it was Justin and I, who first set them free, and because Justin was obviously younger than I. We did not attempt to leave that night, but went together and looked at the metal grid Justin had discovered, and made plans for exploring the air ducts. Jenner was astute at that sort of thing. He could foresee problems. With a vent like this leading to every room, he said, it will be easy to get lost. When we explore, we are going to need some way of finding our way back here. Why should we come back? Someone asked. Because it may take more than one night to find the way out. And if it does, whoever is doing the exploring must be back in his cage by morning. Otherwise, Dr. Schultz will find out. Jenner was right. It took us about a week. What we did, after some more discussion, was to find some equipment. First, a large spool of thread in one of the cabinets was where some, some of us had seen Julie place it one day. Second, a screwdriver that was kept on the shelf near the electrical equipment. Because, as Jenner pointed out, there would probably be a screen over the end of the air, fat, air shaft to keep out debris, and we must have to pry it loose. What we really needed was a light. For the ducks that night were completely dark, but there was none to be had, not even a box of matches. The thread and the screwdriver we hid in the duct a few feet from the entrance. We could only hope they would not be missed, or if they were, we wouldn't be suspected. Justin and two others were chosen as the exploration party. One of the others was Arthur, whom you've met. They had a terrible time at first. Here was a maze to end all mazes, and in the dark they quickly lost their sense of direction. Still, they kept at it, night after night, exploring the network of shafts that laced like a cubicle spiderweb through the walls and ceilings of the building. They would tie the end of the thread to the grid in our laboratory and unroll it from the spool as they went. Time and time again, they reached the end of the thread and had to come back. It just isn't long enough, Justin would complain. Every time I get to the end, I think, 
if I could just go 10 feet further. And finally, that's what he did. On the seventh night, just as the thread ran out, he and the other two reached a shaft that was wider than anything they found before. And it seemed as they walked along to be slanting gently upward, but the spool was empty. You wait here, Justin said to the others. I'm going to just go a little further. Hang on to this pool, and if I call, back, if I call, call back. They had tied the end of the thread around the spool so that they would not lose it in the dark. Justin had a hunch. The air coming through the shaft was a fresher smell where they were and seemed to be blowing harder than in the other shafts. Up ahead, he thought he could hear the whir of a machine running quietly, and there was a faint vibration in the metal under his feet. He went on. The shaft turned upward at a sharp angle, and then straight ahead he saw it a patch of lighter colored darkness than the pitch black around him, and in the middle, three stars twinkling. It was the open sky. Across the opening, there, had, there was Jenner, as predicted, a course of screen of heavy wire. He ran toward it for a few seconds longer and then stopped. The sound of the machine had grown suddenly louder, changing from a whir to a roar. It had obviously shifted speed. An automatic switch somewhere in the building had turned it on, turned it from low to high. And the air blowing past Justin came on so hard it made him gasp. He braced his feet against the metal and held on. In a minute, as suddenly as it roared, the machine returned to a whisper. He looked around and realized he was lucky to have stopped. By the dim light from the sky, he could see that he had reached a point where perhaps two dozen air shafts came together, like branches into a tree trunk. If he had gone a few steps further, he would have never been able to distinguish which shaft was his. He turned his tracks, turned in his tracks, and in a few minutes rejoined his friends. We had a meeting that night, and Justin told all of us what he had found. He had left the thread, anchor by a screwdriver, to guide us out. Some were leaving immediately, but it was too late, and Jenner and I argued against it. We did not know how long it would take us to break through the screen at the end. If it should take more than an hour or two, daylight would be upon us. We would be, then be able, unable to risk returning to the laboratory, and would have to spend the day in the shaft, or try to get away in broad daylight. Dr. Schultz might even figure out that we had gone and trap us in the air shaft. Finally, reluctantly, everyone agreed to spend one more day in the laboratory and leave early the next night. But it was a hard decision. With freedom so near and everybody thinking as I did, suppose, suppose Dr. Schultz grew suspicious and put locks on our cages. Suppose someone found out our thread and pulled it out. This was unlikely. The near end, tied to a spool, was six feet up the shaft and well hidden. Just the same, we were uneasy. Then, just as we were ending our meeting, a new complication arose. We had been standing on a rough circle in the floor laboratory, just outside the two screen doors that enclosed the mice cages. Now, from inside the cabinet came a voice. Nicodemus. It was clear but plaintive call. It was a clear but plaintive call. The sound of a mouse. We had almost forgotten that the mice were there, and I, had star I was startled to hear that one of them knew my name. We all grew quiet. Who's calling me? I asked. My name is Jonathan, said the voice. Hmm, you guys all know who that is. We have been listening to your talk about going out. We would like to go too, but we cannot open our cages. As you can imagine, this caused a certain cons consternation. Consternation. I don't know what that means. Coming at the last minute. None of us knew much about the mice, except that we had heard Dr. Schultz dictate on into his tape recorder. From that, we had learned only that they had been getting the same injections as we were getting, and that the treatment had worked out as well on them as on us. They were a sort of side experiment without a control group. Justin was studying the cabinet. Why not, he said, if we can get the doors open. Someone muttered, they'll slow us down. No, said the mouse, Jonathan, we will not. Only open our cages when you go and we will make our own way. We won't even stay with you if you prefer. How many of you are you? How, ma how many are you, I asked. Only eight, and the cabinet doors are easy to open. There's just a simple hook halfway up. But Justin and Arthur had already figured out that out. They climbed up the screen, unhooked the hook, and the door swung open. The cages open the same ways as yours, said another mouse, but we can't reach far enough to unlatch them. All right, I said. Tomorrow night, as soon as Dr. Schultz and the others leave, we'll open your cages and you can follow the thread with us to get out. After that, you're on your own. Agreed, said Jonathan, and thank you. And now, I said, we should all get back to the cages. Justin, please hook the doors again. I had latched myself into my cage and was getting ready to sleep when I heard a scratching noise on the door, and there was Jenner climbing down from above. Nicodemus, he said, can I come in? Of course, but it get, it's getting on toward morning. I won't stay long. He unlatched the door and entered. There's something we've got to decide. I know, I said, I've been thinking about it too. When we do get out, where are we going to go? I could not see Jenner's face in the dark cage, but I knew from his voice that he was worrying. I said, 
At first I thought home, of course, but then I began remembering. I realized that that won't work. We could find the way, I suppose, now that we can read. But if we did, what then? We wouldn't find anybody that we know. And yet, Jenner said, you know that that's not the real point. No. The real point is this. We don't know where to go because we don't know what we are. Do you want to go back living in a sewer pipe and eating other people's garbage? Because that's not what rat, that, cause that's what rats do. But the fact is, we aren't rats anymore. We're something Dr. Schultz has made. Something new. Dr. Schultz says our intelligence has increased more than 1,000%. I suspect he's underestimated. I think we're probably as intelligent as he is, and maybe more. We can read, and with a little practice, we'll be able to write, too. I mean to do both. I think we can learn to do anything we want. But where do we do it? Where does a group of civilized rats fit in? I don't know, I said. We're going to have to find out. It won't be easy. But even so, the first step must be to get out of here. We're lucky to have a chance, but it won't last. We're a jump ahead of Dr. Schultz. If he knew what we knew, we know, he wouldn't leave us alone here another night, and he's sure to find out soon. Another thing to worry about, Jenner said, if we do get away, what he finds when we're gone, won't he figure out what we did? And he won't realize that we must have learned to read. Probably. And then what? What will happen when he announces there's a group of civilized rats roaming loose? Rats that can read and think and figure things out? I said, let's wait until we're free before we have to worry about that. But Jenner was right. It was a thing to worry about, and maybe it still is. The next day was terrible. I kept expecting to hear Dr. Schultz say, who took my screwdriver? And then to hear Julie add, my thread is missing too. That could have happened and set them to thinking, but it didn't. And that night, an hour after Julie, George, and Dr. Schultz left the laboratory, we were out of our cages and gathered, the whole group of us, before the mouse cabinet. Justin opens its, opened its doors, unlatched their cages, and the mice came out. They looked very small and frightened, but one strode bravely forward. You are Nicodemus, he said to me. I'm Jonathan. Thank you for taking us out with you. We're not out yet, I said, but you're welcome. We had no time for chatting. The light coming in the windows was turning gray. In less than an hour, it would be dark, and we would need light to figure out how to open the screen at the end of the shaft. We went to the opening in the baseboard. Justin, I said, take the lead. Roll up the thread as you go. I'll bring up the rear. No noise. There's sure to be somebody awake in the building. We don't want them to hear us. I did not want to leave the thread where it might be found. The more I thought about it, the more I felt do sure Dr. Schultz would try to track us down for quite a few reasons. Justin lifted the grid, pushed open the sliding panel, and one by one we went through. As I watched the others go ahead of me, I noticed for the first time that one of the mice, one of the mice was white. Then I went in myself, closing the grid behind me and pushing the panel half shut again in its normal position. With Justin leading the way, we moved through the dark passage quickly and easily. In only 15 or 20 minutes, we had reached the end of the thread. Then, as Justin has told us it would, the shaft widened. We could hear the whir of the machine ahead, and almost immediately we saw the square of the gray daylight. We had reached the end of the shaft, and that's when, that's, there a terrible thing happened. Justin, you will recall, has told us that the machine, the pump that pulled air through the shaft, had switched from a low speed to a high when he had first explored through there. So we were forewarned, 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 that's a hard word. The trouble was, the trouble was the forewarning was no use at all, not so far as the mice were concerned. We were approaching the lighted square of the opening when the roar began. The blast of air came like a sudden whistling gale. It took my breath and flattened my ears against my head, and I closed my eyes instinctively. I was still in the rear, and when I opened my eyes again, I saw one of the mice sliding past me, claw clawing uselessly with his little nails at the smooth metal beneath him. Another followed him, and still another, as one by one they were blown backward in the dark maze of tunnels we had just left. I braced myself in the corner of the shaft and grabbed at one as he slid by. It was the white mouse. I caught him by one leg, pulled him around behind me, and held on. Another blue face another blue face on blue face on into the rat ahead of me and stopped there. It was Jonathan who had been near the lead, but the rest were lost, six in all. They were simply too light. They blew away like dead leaves, and we never saw them again. In another minute, the roar stopped. The rush of the air slowed from a gale to a breeze, and we were able to for go forward again. I said to the white mouse, you better hold on to me. That might happen again. He looked at me in dismay. But what about the others? Six are lost. I've got to go back and look for them. Jonathan quickly joined him. I'll go with you. No, I said. That would be useless and foolish. You have no idea what shaft they were blown into. Not even if they were all went the same way. And if you should find them again... How would you find your way out again? And suppose the wind comes again. Then there would be eight lost instead of six. The wind did come again, 
half a dozen times more while we worked on the screwdriver to pry open the screen. Each time we had stopped to work and hang on. The two mice clung to the screen itself. Some of us braced ourselves behind the them in case they should slip. And Justin, taking the thread with him as a guideline, went back to search for the other six. He explored shaft after shaft to the end of the spool, calling it softly as he went. But it was futile. To this day, we still don't know what became of those six mice. They may have found their way out eventually, or they may have died in there. We left an opening in the screen for them, just in case. The screen, it was heavy wire with holes about the size of an acorn, and it was set in a steel frame. We pried and hammered at it with a screwdriver, but we could not move it. It was fastened on the outside, and we couldn't see how. Finally, the white mouse had an idea. Push the screwdriver through the wire near the bottom, he said, and pry it up. We did it again, prying down, then left, then right. The hole in the wire grew slowly bigger, until the white mouse said, I think that's enough. He climbed to the small opening, and by squirming and twisting, he got through. Jonathan followed him. They both fell out of sight. But in a minute, Jonathan's head came back into view on the outside. It's a sliding bolt, he said. We're working on it. Inside, we could hear the faint rasping as the two mice tugged on the bolt handle, working it back. Then the crack at the base of the wide, the screen widened. We pushed it open, and we were standing on the roof of Nim, free. All right, go ahead and go fill out that Google form.